Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alan Mattiso, Associate Director for Academic Programs at the Baker Institute, and I'm very pleased to see such a, a large crowd here tonight for a special event. Uh, many decades ago, when I was a graduate student in history, I was interested to, to learn how many really good works of history were written by journalists. And um, our event tonight is a case in point. Our speaker is John Avalon. Um, he is a distinguished journalist. And the subject of his talk is his book, whose title is up there. And it is, it is a work of history. Uh, Mr. Avalon uh, got his BA from Yale, his MBA from Columbia. Uh, in the latter part of Mayor Giuliani's uh, terms as mayor, uh, he was a speechwriter for the mayor. And he was with the mayor uh, in, in uh, September 11th um, as the mayor made his international reputation on that occasion. In 2002, um, Mr. Avalon uh, went to work for a newspaper called the New York Sun. It's the first print newspaper uh, that started in New York in about uh, three quarters of a century. And it was um, a, a right of center paper, and it was noted for uh, the number of um, distinguished uh, conservative, conservative intellectuals uh, who were among um, its columnists. It um, didn't survive as a print paper, but it's, I, I believe it's still online. Uh, and um, I guess that, is that how you began your, your journalist career as a, yeah. 2008, he moved to the Daily Beast uh, at a time when America was going online for the news. And he rose uh, through the ranks. And in 2013, he became the editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast. And by all accounts, he was responsible for making it one of the most uh, uh, important news outlets in the United States. I, I think now it has a, a more than a million hits a day. And if you're a cable news junkie, you can turn it on. And there's always a scoop from the Daily Beast. Um, 2008, uh, he, or 2018, um, he left the Daily Beast. Um, by then, he was, he was, he was a known uh, TV presence. Uh, appeared on many TV shows uh, and uh, was well known on CNN. And he moved to CNN where he became a senior political analyst. And you can see him uh, on New Day, which is the, the morning show uh, on uh, CNN. So he's had a varied and very successful career in journalism. But he also has a political position. Um, he, was, he is a, a self-described centrist. And uh, he has been active in promoting a centrist politics. Uh, in the year 2010, he founded No Labels, which was uh, an organization that um, invited Republicans, Democrats, and independents to work toward nonpartisan solutions of public policy issues. And he's also uh, been active in a group called Reshape New York, whose purpose is to end this insane uh, partisan effort to gerrymander um, um, uh, congressional and, I guess, legislative seats, um, I guess with only modest success up to this point. Um, good cause. Um, and he's written books. So this is always amazes me about uh, journalism because they, they carry on these intense careers. At the same time, uh, uh, so many of them, uh, or at least so many of the best, write books. And this is true of, of John Avalon. His first book was in 2004 called Independent Nation, How the Vital Center is Changing American Politics. At that point, um, he was arguing that the center is, is, where, is where the action is. Um, and uh, if you want to understand American policy, you have to understand the center. Well, a lot happened between then and his second book, <laughs> which was published in 2010, and has as its title, Wing Nuts, How the Lunatic Fringe is Hijacking America. <laughs> and he meant um, on both, both extremes. <laughs> 
And then in 2017, he published the book, which is the subject of our, our meeting today. Uh, it is um, the great advantage that the journalists have, which not enough historians, I must say, also have, is they can write. And this is a wonderful narrative history. I mean, it's a pleasure to read it. But it's more than that. It's, it's a serious history because in order to write it, John Avalon had to immerse himself in the political culture of the early republic. Uh, and he does that, and he recreates it uh, for the reader. You're there. And he does that because uh, he has to explain his hero, who is George Washington. And one of the remarkable things about the book is he's able uh, to take Washington and make him not only a monument, but a, a flesh and blood, blood human being. Um, the point of, the, of creating the context for Washington's presidency is to, is to uh, remind us of the acrimony, the partisanship, the extremism, the scurrilous journalism of the 1790s. Um, that, I think, is, is uh, not often remembered, but Washington lived through it, and it exhausted him. And at the end of his, his two terms, uh, he wrote a farewell address, which was shaped by that experience. Um, the, um, the address is, is the central part of the book, uh, the history leading up to it, Washington's experience, and then chapters on on the, on the address itself, which each of which is a, a, a political meditation. And of course, the point of it is that if we're going to succeed as a republic, uh, we need to cultivate the virtues of moderation um, and civility and balance. Uh, the interesting thing to me about the book is that uh, Mr. Avalon doesn't say that Washington was writing a testament for us. He doesn't have to say that because it's clear on every page. And of course, um, Washington was. So um, what we have here is a, 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 a distinguished work of history by a distinguished American political journalist. Uh, and if you want to read this book, you have an opportunity to buy it here in the rear. Uh, at the end of the lecture, and Mr. Avalon will be signing books. Uh, so I hope you'll take advantage of that. And um, uh, we look forward to, to hearing this talk. So please welcome Mr. Avalon to the Baker Institute podium. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, uh, and thank you all. Um, it is a great honor and a pleasure to be at the Baker Institute. Uh, and I want to recognize my beautiful bride, Margaret Hoover, who you may recognize from Firing Line, uh, who, who joined me uh, for this trip. And we're going to road trip to Austin tomorrow. But uh, tonight is definitely um, the main event. Um, and that's because I, I think that Secretary Baker's position in American history uh, has become more dear to us more relevant, I think especially with the passing of George H.W. Bush just a few months ago. Because I think it gave our nation a time to reflect on the values of selfless service that their generation embodied. It's a reminder of the timeless virtues that the Founding Fathers wanted us to remember as a way of defending our republic. The ideas of courage and character and a sense of history matter. That to whom much is given, much is expected that each generation must earn our independence anew. And then when it comes to the wider world, partisanship ought to end at the water's edge. And here at home, we must always strive, however fitfully, to form a more perfect union, remembering that there is always more that unites us as Americans than divides us. Those ideas are under assault today, it's fair to say, which is why it's so important to have these vivid examples within living memory and to honor them appropriately. Because George H.W. Bush and Jim Baker embodied these ideas and ideals. I think their endearing to us is aided by the fact that they always took their job seriously, but not themselves. 
makes us able to see them not as distant figures carved in stone, but flesh and blood, friends striving to do their best, often against the odds, succeeding in the end and handing the nation and the world to the next generation better than they found it. None of us can ask for more. None of us will achieve nearly as much, but we can all seek to apply those lessons to our lives and our country's life going forward. And in some ways, that's what my book, Washington's Farewell, is all about. I think the Founding Fathers would have recognized in George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush and Jim Baker, kindred spirits, despite the dramatic changes in our nation and the world, even as they might look around today at our hyperpartisan domestic debates and say, we warned you. The Founding Fathers did try to warn us. Washington did try to warn us. And of course, the challenges they faced in the founding decades of our nation were far greater than anything we face today. They were surrounded by dangers and doubts, and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred liberty, and their sacred honor in pursuit of liberty. The stakes for them were nothing less than life and death. But it's interesting that after the defeat of the British, where too often our history books end, that's when, in some ways, the real danger and drama began, because the founders understood that the great, our greatest enemy in a democracy is often ourselves. And that's what I think we're confronting today. That's why they studied the fall of ancient Greece and Rome, that the decline and fall of the Roman Empire was one of the books most taken out in the Congressional Library in those first two sessions in the city of New York. And John Adams, always sort of a pessimistic fellow, warned that there hadn't been yet a democracy that didn't die by suicide. So these were the stakes. And I think you see, even in that early days of triumph, where we assume, I think, overly simplified, that the nation was on a glide path to success, that the American character, and this is a little bit reassuring, has always fluctuated between our native defiant optimism and a deeper anxiety about American decline from our earliest days. And that's why it falls to each generation to not only keep the torch of liberty alight, but to pass on that more perfect union to the next generation. And beginning with Washington, but continuing through, our greatest presidents have always understood this truth which Washington gave us and it crystallized in the farewell address, that our independence as a nation is inseparable from our interdependence as a people. Our independence as a nation is inseparable from our interdependence as a people. That's the message he set out to communicate to future generations in the farewell address. And that's the story, the bit of useful history, I hope, that I'd like to share with you today. Now, Washington's farewell address was once the most famous speech in America. It was more widely reprinted than the Declaration of Independence for the first 150 years of our republic. Then it fell out of favor for a variety of reasons and faded from the frontal lobe of American politics. But it is a prophetic document. And its message is, I believe, more relevant than ever before. So let me set the scene. It's Philadelphia, September 1796. And George Washington has been a reluctant president through it all. This was not simply a, a pose. He really did, would much rather have been at Mount Vernon with Martha. He wanted to resign after his first term in office, but was convinced by his two most talented surrogate sons, Jefferson and Hamilton, who couldn't agree on anything, that if he resigned after one term that the nation could very well descend into civil war, even then. And so he continued, increasingly exhausted, irritable, surprisingly insecure at times, through his second term, and did solidify the nation against all odds. Even as the first independent president, he was dismayed to see parties emerge beneath him, led by Hamilton. And so as he prepared to depart and finally make good on his threat to leave and create the two-term precedent, he assembled what I think is clearly the greatest team of ghostwriters in history, and that's not just a former speechwriter talking, because he wanted to come up with a document that would live beyond him, that would express the sum total of all the hard-won wisdom from his life in 50 years of service in war and peace. And notably, he decided to publish it in a newspaper, not delivering it in front of Congress like a European king. That was intentional. He selected a newspaper, the Philadelphia Daily Advertiser, gave the editor quite a fright and the scoop of the century, by the way. Um, and it was not one of the partisan papers at the time. He knew it would disseminate organically throughout the country, and that's what it did. 
and rather beautifully, it was addressed to my friends and fellow citizens. Friends and fellow citizens. I think that's a term we should all keep in mind. He could have written a valedictory victory lap and said, look what a great president I've been. The country's in infinitely better shape than it was when I came in. You're welcome. <laughs> but instead, he's tried to start a new precedent, something that presidents have carried forward ever since. It's the parting warning from a friend. And Washington really did organize his farewell address as a warning to his fellow citizens and future generations about the forces he feared could destroy our democratic republic, rooted in the lessons of history as well as his life and his presidency. And chief among them, hyperpartisanship, excessive debt, foreign wars and foreign influence in our domestic debates. Remember I said he could have said he warned us? He did. Those are old, dangerous themes to a democratic republic, and we have been indulging them in recent years. But Washington was too much a man of action to simply point out the problems and hustle off stage. He proposed solutions rooted in durable wisdom that we can still draw on today, and that's why the document retains its magic and its majesty and ability to guide us. And he did it by proposing what I call in the book, pillars of liberty, upon which the edifice of our society could be built. Now, liberty is an interesting word. It gets thrown around a lot, sometimes too simply. And we consider it today to be synonymous with freedom and independence. But the founding fathers and their generation understood it, those words to be distinct. Independence was what they'd achieved by defeating Great Britain. We became an independent nation on the world stage. Freedom could be a state of nature that could just be you on the frontier alone without a care in the world and any responsibility. Liberty implies a degree of self-discipline. Liberty is the responsibility we assume individually and collectively to maintain a free society. It takes work. It takes effort. It's not license or indulgence. It's something different and obviously ultimately more meaningful. And so Washington laid out these pillars of liberty in his farewell address. And the first one, the biggest one, is the, simply the idea of national unity. It seems obvious to us now, but of course, part of the revolutionary project was could that generation stitched together a democratic republic on such a scale that had never been tried before. People thought democracies could exist maybe in a couple of Swiss cantons, but not over 13 colonies spread over that degree of space and landmass. It's also an illusion that they were all, you know, British rebels. They weren't. Our nation wasn't even unified by a common language. They spoke Dutch in upstate New York. French, closer to Vermont. German, in the area of outside Philadelphia, known as Germantown. It's a reminder that our nation has always been a diverse liberal democracy since our earliest days. It's just our definition of diversity has changed over time, and that's a good thing. But that's a characteristic we have contained since our earliest days. And to balance that essential diversity requires a focus and emphasis on national unity. And that's why Washington and the Founding Fathers also picked our national motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. That's the core promise, that's the core premise, that's the genius of America in one phrase. And so Washington said in his farewell address, citizens by birth or choice of a common country, that country has a right to concentrate your affections. The name American, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation deserved from local discriminations. What he's saying there is we must transcend our tribalism to survive. We have all our interesting differences even then, but we must elevate what unites us over what divides us consciously, and that's an existential concern for the nation, especially at that time, which is why he took care to travel most of the 13 colonies at that time. He was consciously trying to build a national identity, a national character 
where none had succeeded. And part of what he was trying to bridge is particularly relevant to our domestic debates today. Because even at that time, there were dividing lines evident in the debate over the ratification of the Constitution, which pit largely urban advocates of a stronger national central government, pushing national unity, against more rural populists who passionately defended states' rights as a proxy for protecting their way of life against forces of economic and cultural change. Sound familiar? Both sides believe they're fighting for freedom. That's important too. The assumption of goodwill that is at the base of democracy that we sometimes lose sight of. But Washington was trying constantly throughout his presidency to heal those rifts that existed even before we had political parties. So it's a reminder that our debates are deep. They're honest. But they also seem small in the light of history at times. Washington warned in particular against the rise of regional political parties. He saw that as the thin edge of the wedge that could lead to civil war. He warned against what he called pretend patriots. Those were people who walked around pretending they were more patriotic than the other guy. Using that old demagogue's calling card of us against them. He worried and warned about that even in the earliest days of our republic to always emphasize national unity as a balm against the divisiveness which he knew through history could kill a democratic republic. But national unity can seem a bit amorphous. And so Washington was a little more explicit then I think he gets credit for or we recognize for backing a muscular moderation as the key to political wisdom, something that I think is particularly relevant here at the Baker Institute because it's a political philosophy that has seemed politically homeless at times. But if you go back to the Founding Fathers, it's very clear. It's not an accident the Constitution didn't contain political parties. It wasn't an oversight. Washington hoped that political parties wouldn't emerge, that members of Congress would represent their conscience and their constituents and cobble together new coalitions. He knew we had to strike a wise balance between extremes, and indeed, the Founding Fathers' understanding of the importance and the wisdom of moderation was rooted in classical wisdom, going back to Aristotle and the golden mean. The democracy itself depends upon that kind of constructive collaboration, that give and take, that at its best, the vital center implies and executes upon that principled compromise that frankly gave birth to the Constitution. Also, there was the specter of the English Civil War behind them, and authors that had really beautifully written, including Joseph Addison, a figure not well remembered today, but who was very influential to the teenage Washington and many of the young founding fathers, uh, who would warn against that tribalism that could easily erupt into civil war. And so Washington wrote this in his farewell address. The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, is itself a frightful despotism. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindling the animosity of one part against the other foments occasional riots and insurrection. There being constant dangers of excess, the effort ought to be by force of public opinion to mitigate and assuage it. In an earlier draft, he was even more explicit and wrote this, it's safe to assert that the conflicts of popular factions are the chief, if not the only, inlets of usurpation and tyranny. Washington warned us about the dangers of hyperpartisanship, about demonizing fellow citizens in a democracy, that that had always been a wedge that had been used ultimately to remove the liberty that we fought so hard to maintain. And so we need to keep that in mind when we talk about politics today, when we hear people preaching the siren song of tribal identity, of us against them, because Washington was very clear also about the dangers that could come out of a deeply divided government dominated by special interests where the national interest gets obscured. He warned that the founding fathers, and, and this was echoed by Hamilton, that 
That kind of a deadlock could create such an inefficient and ineffective government that would open the door to a demagogue with authoritarian ambitions. That these are the stakes. They've repeated through history. And Washington had that in mind, as did the founders when they were creating our republic, which is why we have an obligation to rediscover that wisdom right now. But of course, it's not just politics in a society. The web of, our, of any nation is deeper than simply politics, although things have a way of creeping into politics. There's math has its own merciless logic. And fiscal discipline was another pillar of liberty that President, uh, that President Washington wanted to hammer home aided by the fact that one of his chief ghostwriters on the speech, probably the primary, was Alexander Hamilton. James Madison took a, a back seat, frankly, in the final document. But Washington and certainly Hamilton understood that debt is a force that can topple empires. It is a threat to self-sufficiency for individuals and nations. And so Washington wrote, as a very important source of strength and security, cherish public credit, not only by shunning occasions of expense, but by vigorous exertion in times of peace to discharge the debts that unavoidable wars may have occasioned, not ungenerously throwing upon posterity the burden which we ourselves ought to bear. Don't pass the buck to the next generation. Man up and deal with the math. Pay down your debts. But we don't, and we're not. And what Washington understood was that that was incredibly dangerous for democratic republics and any nation throughout history. He also had some timely words about taxes. Next month it'll be tax season. Quote, it's essential that you should practically bear in mind that toward the payment of debt there must be revenue, and that to have revenue there must be taxes, and that no taxes may be devised which are not more or less inconvenient and unpleasant. <laughs> this is relevant stuff, folks. But it was also personal. When Washington was a uh, young farmer, before the revolution, he felt the sting of being deeply in debt to a British company called Carey and Company. And he understood, as many of the founders did, as George, uh, Benjamin Franklin famously said, that to be into debt gives someone else control over your freedom. And that's a lesson that they kept in mind. The, the Revolutionary War itself, one of the big turning points was when the United States finally got its finances under control by an extraordinary individual who's been largely forgotten named Robert Morris, the financier of the revolution, who really taught Hamilton everything he knew about finance. And the issue, by the way, wasn't a degree of debt. It's excessive debt. A degree of debt can be a very good thing for a nation at war, for a nation building its infrastructure. It's when you give another nation control over your freedom and your sovereignty that you're in trouble. The failure of the Articles of Confederation, for what it's worth, were, yes, related to not a strong enough central government, but also because they couldn't, get, they couldn't really compel the states to give any money over to the federal government, recreating the problem they had during the Revolutionary War. Alexander Hamilton famously saying that getting money from the states is like preaching to the dead little coda, which I think is kind of profound about Robert Morris, because he was the wealthiest man. He was the financier of the revolution. He was a good friend of George Washington's. Um, towards the end of his life, he engaged in land speculation and uh, went deeply in debt and ended up in debtor's prison uh, around the street, uh, around the corner from the presidential mansion in Philadelphia. And he was renounced by many of his friends. It was very unfashionable to be in debtor's prison, but not George Washington, who became the only president to visit an inmate in prison for dinner one night. I think it speaks to his character that he maintained his relationships, um, but it was certainly a cautionary tale for both him and the nation that someone could fall from those heights that quickly. Virtue and religion are pillars of liberty, and ones we don't talk enough about, it seems to me, but they were very much top of mind to the Founding Fathers for whom the cultivation of character was paramount particularly for Washington. And one of Washington's most frequent aphorisms is, there can be no happiness without virtue. In the farewell address, he did a variation on this and said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Now, I wanna 
be careful to not give the impression sometimes by pushed with folks with an agenda that Washington was representing a specific sectarian or fundamentalist vision of faith. He was not. He was a non-Orthodox believer. He drew upon the Stoics, reading Seneca his whole life. He was a Mason, and those views flew, flew, uh, informed his, his understanding of the universe. Also an Anglican, um, not the least, but not at the expense of all others. Um, it was a bit scandalous at his time that the President of the United States uh, did not kneel in church or take communion. And one day, uh, a preacher in Philadelphia decided he would send a message to the president from the pulpit, um, uh, really castigating those folks who you know, didn't see fit to take communion once they came to church, as Martha did. Um, there was a bit of murmur in the crowd, and, and later that day at lunch, a senator turned to the president and said, did you hear the message the preacher had for you? Washington said, indeed, I did. He said, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm not going to go back to that church. Well, why? <laughs> it wasn't a fit of peak. It's that he didn't want to be seen as a political hypocrite on the issue of faith. He didn't want to change his behavior to curry favor. And that's sort of the man he was. But if you look deeper into his writings, the idea of religion and morality, Washington understood on a very practical as well as inspirational level how essential those things are to a self-governing society. If you haven't read his letter to a Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, do. It's a beautiful document about American first principles. And he establishes very clearly that the United States is going to be a beacon of freedom without discrimination, specifically a beacon of freedom that gives bigotry no sanction. It's a beautiful reminder whenever we have these occasional wrestles with issues of religious freedom and tolerance in our country that Washington understood that religious liberty as well as morality and virtue, those things often being the same thing, but not always, are indispensable supports to our nation. So too, education. And this is a bit of an irony because Washington was the least formally educated founding father. He was actually, occasionally you pick up little sneers by other founding fathers in Washington's direction, particularly from John Adams, who did a lot of sneering. But Washington was actually quite insecure about this in almost an endearing way. He therefore became an autodidact. He had a voluminous library. Now, he most enjoyed reading most of the books, the, the predominant, were um, about military matters or agriculture. He, he knew his core strengths. Um, but at the same time, you know, he bought a four-volume uh, 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 edition of Don Quixote the day uh, that the Constitution was signed in Philadelphia, perhaps speaking to the quixotic nature of the experiment. But, um, but he was really a determined autodidact, and he loved, uh, for example, um, a play called Cato, which he had performed at Valley Forge, uh, which evoked the heroism of the early Roman Republic. His mind was slow in operation, but he would always, he was very steady. He wasn't flashy or quick or brilliant like many of the other founding fathers. He only spoke English. Madison spoke four languages, including Hebrew. But because of that, I think he cherished education more than the others. And his dream was to create a national university as a way of combating those regional divides and discriminations that he was so concerned could divide our nation and doom our republic. And he wrote in the farewell address, promote then as an object of primary importance institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge. In proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion, it is essential that public opinion should be enlightened. That's particularly important. It's essential that public opinion ought to be enlightened in a self-governing society. That means education is an obligation, civic education in particular, although I believe Washington would have argued that all education is a form of civic education. And that's why he wanted to, and it put his money, personal money where his mouth was, to, to build a national university, which in a reminder that even George Washington didn't get everything he wanted from Congress, Congress said no. He even got the land. He wanted to build it on the, where the National Observatory is, where the Vice President lives. 
Uh, ultimately, his secondary plan was the National Military Academy got put through at West Point under Jefferson. But it was a sort of grace frustration that he could not convince Congress to create a national university. But that's one of the reasons why you've got the University of Virginia, the University of North Carolina. We defaulted to more state run vision of higher education. But this was a core point of pride that we needed to build a collective national identity and that our democracy would only succeed if we had an enlightened citizenry. And he hammered that home again and again. And I think particularly at a time when we have, if not denigrated, ignored this primacy of civic education in our country. We've devalued the teaching of American history, of how the government works. We've created a sense of separation from citizens and their government by not strengthening those bonds early on. And we're gonna have to find a way to change that as a nation. Probably gonna have to be, frankly, patriotic philanthropy, but organizations and institutions like this help. Final pillar of liberty, as a foreign policy of independence. Now, if I were to ask any of you, if you knew any phrases from Washington's farewell address, you might, might, have said no entangling alliances. That phrase does not actually appear in the farewell address. Um, but the essential idea does, even though it's been twisted, and, and I think rather intentionally. Washington wanted to communicate the idea that America had unique strengths rooted in our geography. It's really well expressed by Will Rogers, who's, uh, I think, an undervalued American, who once said this. He said, America's uh, got the two best friends any nation ever had. You know who they are? The Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. <laughs> we were insulated by geography from the chaos and the troubles of continental Europe, which is why he was so careful to not have our nation throw in with any other nation in a broad alliance. This was a particular piece of luck that we had this beautiful land that could be largely self-sufficient. And he was specific, he just wanted 20 years, a few decades to grow in economic and military strength so we could be seen as an independent nation on the world stage and not function as a satellite to any other nation's self-interest. This also was rooted in the experience of ancient Greece and Rome. Go back to ancient you know, Athens, where you know, King Philip of Macedon infiltrated ancient Athens, and this was discussed during the Constitutional Convention, bought off a couple of the local elected officials, pretended it was aid, weakened the republic, got it divided to such an extent that it was easy to conquer. These are playbooks that have been used throughout history, and the Founding Fathers, because they understood history, were very aware of it. So they were constantly trying to build a structure and a set of principles to act as an antidote to it. Also, as a soldier, he understood that ancient Roman principle that the best way to secure peace is to prepare for war. But he really did have a vision of an independent nation on a world stage that would not be driven by alliances that could degenerate into costly foreign wars. Said he imagined a, a very futuristic for his time vision of a world that was united by economic ties. He said, observe good faith and justice toward all nations. Cultivate, cultivate peace and harmony with all. The great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is extending our commercial relations to have a little political connection as possible. But he said, the period is not far off when we may choose peace or war as our interest guided by justice shall counsel. That last line is the key because it punctures the idea that Washington was advocating isolationism. And Washington's farewell address has sometimes been used as a fig leaf for that idea, but that's not what Washington was saying at all. He wanted us to grow in strength, to be respected as an independent nation on the world stage. He didn't want to throw in with England or France, the two fighting, feuding world powers at the time, because he knew we had to walk a middle ground between monarchy and the mob. He was not swayed by Jefferson and Madison saying we should throw in with the French Revolution, because he understood that not only was that a monstrous new kind of tyranny, but that tyranny always is the quickest path, rather anarchy is always the quickest path to tyranny. So that's again part of the wisdom of an independent middle path between the extremes. Very briefly, 
the afterlife of the idea is almost as fascinating as the speech itself. Washington felt like he was shouting in the wind towards the end of his second term. Here he, an independent president as a matter of principle, warning against the rise of hyperpartisanship, watching political parties begin under his nose within his cabinet. Jefferson and Adams feuding bitterly, culminating in the election of 1800, where Jefferson wins. And Jefferson has been surreptitiously trying to undermine Washington from with, as Secretary of State, railing against these principles that he's advising, trying to get him to thrown in with revolutionary France. And then something remarkable occurs. Jefferson gets up, takes the oath of office, and in his famous first inaugural address, he is revealed as a born-again Washingtonian. All of a sudden, he's the one saying, we are all Federalists. We are all Democratic Republicans. Every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. He hadn't been acting that way in opposition, let me tell you. But sometimes where you stand is a matter of where you sit. And the predominance of Washington's views when viewing the nation from that national perspective of responsibility in the presidency becomes clarifying. Andrew Jackson's farewell speech is basically a 30-page rumination on the wisdom of Washington's farewell, particularly warning against secession. That he said, look, when Washington's time, we didn't know if the Constitution would succeed. Now we do. Do not listen to these people who say that we can divide as a nation or emphasize these divisions and all will be well. It won't. Lincoln's 1860s stump speech specifically called back to Washington's farewell. And when the Civil War broke out, Lincoln had the speech read to his troops to remind them what they were fighting for in the midst of battle. And then after the war was ended, some folks said that the big mistake is that we'd forgotten Washington's wisdom and the speech became part of our curriculum in public schools throughout the nation as a way of reuniting the nation. In World War I, it started to fall out of favor. There were odious misappropriations by an early incarnation of America first. Not a political commentary what they were actually called. Uh, and, and, and a Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden in 1938 where the keynote speech is given behind a 30-foot banner of George Washington. And it's all about trying to twist Washington's wisdom to their own ends. The irony being, if there's ever an example of a pretend patriot advancing another nation's agenda, it was the German-American Bund who were under the payroll of Adolf Hitler. And it's a reminder of how we need to be careful of sort of odious misappropriations of the founder's wisdom. Eisenhower's farewell address, that brilliant meditation on the dangers of the military-industrial complex explicitly based on Washington's farewell. Lyndon Johnson would like to refer to it with regard to public education. Reagan, the importance of religion and morality and society. George H.W. Bush, his farewell address at West Point explicitly talks about Washington's farewell address. Talks about the importance, frankly, of entangling alliances in, this, in a new world order he was trying to create and warned against people pushing ideas of isolationism that they were not in America's interest. And even Barack Obama in his farewell address offered an extended paragraph riffing on explicitly Washington's farewell address. I remember it particularly not only because I was covering it for CNN, but because it was the day the book came out. <laughs> and you can imagine uh, my uh, emails to the publisher. Uh, the president just endorsed our, uh, the, the book. But <laughs> Obama's words actually are relevant too. We should reject the first dawning of every attempt to alienate any portion of our country from the rest or to enfable the, secret, enfeeble the sacred ties that make us one. We weaken those ties when we allow our political dialogue to become so corrosive that people of good character are turned off from public service. So coarse with rancor that Americans with whom we disagree are not just misguided, but somehow malevolent. We weaken those ties when we define some of us as more American than others. It falls to each of us to be those anxious, jealous guardians of our democracy, to embrace the joyous task we've been given to continually try to improve this great nation of ours. Because for all our outward differences, we all share the same proud title, citizen. That's an expression 
of that founding wisdom handed down from Washington that our independence as a nation is inseparable from our interdependence as a people. That we need to find ways every generation does of making the old story new again. And I'll say, I think that's part of the genius of the play Hamilton. It does it so well in terms of taking a lot of these ideas and ideals and making them relevant to a new generation and making that gift that we've been given, which is our history, understood to be just that, a gift that can evolve and transform but keep its core characteristics intact. So in conclusion, I think we need to understand, particularly at moments like our own, that while the future is always inherently uncertain, that there are sound clouds on the horizon, that the United States is not immune from the larger lessons of history. And like the Founding Fathers, we have an obligation to study the mistakes that toppled republics before us. The challenges we face are significant, but they are small compared to those chased by Washington and the revolutionary generation when America was still fragile and unformed. But the first step in confronting a problem is admitting it exists. And I think we do need to admit that we have drifted far from our best political traditions and the spirit of the Founding Fathers at this moment in history. One way to look at the wisdom of Washington's farewell is that he warned us against being unwisely off-center in politics, finance, and foreign policy, risking the real liberty that comes from self-sufficiency. But our two political parties have become polarized along ideological and geographic lines, as Washington feared reducing faith in the effectiveness of our government and opening the door to demagogues. Our debt's increasing to unsustainable levels, 22 trillion at last, primarily owned or largely owned by one of our unfree geopolitical rivals, China. We have indulged in foreign wars of choice while we see new cyberspace manifestations of foreign attempts to influence our elections and government. Vladimir Putin didn't come up with that playbook all by himself. These are just new variations to an old game, which Washington warned aimed to mislead public opinion, to influence or awe public councils. It's happening through social media now, but the stakes remain the same. So we need to name these problems and then chart our course without defaulting to partisan excuses or expediency. And that's why I think a new generation of Washingtonians is needed. People who are determined to put country over party, Advancing limited but energetic and inclusive government, guided by the governing principle of moderation. Striking a wise balance between individual liberty and generational responsibility. And, and rejecting overextension and separatism from whatever the source. The farewell can still guide our decisions and make us wiser and better citizens giving us the lens to apply enduring principles to changing times, balancing realism and idealism, because that's how imperfect people form a more perfect union. We commune with each other, we commune with history, and we draw upon those reservoirs to renew ourselves, defining new common ground and common purpose, because now it is our story to carry forward as friends and fellow citizens. Thank you very much. I'd be delighted to take some questions. Start with you, sir, and then toggle back and forth. Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, which part of Washington farewell speech you think Donald Trump will take in his farewell speech? <laughs> that seems like an unfair first question. <laughs> well, uh, again, given the, that one of the great traditions that uh, Washington set was the, the farewell warning, um, you know, Trump certainly began with a, a vision of American carnage, so I suppose he could declare victory and go home. Um, the, the beauty of the farewell address, I will say, is that it's not, it, 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 part of its power comes from the fact that it doesn't represent any one political faction or ideology today. There's something in it for everybody which speaks, I think, to the broader wisdom it expresses, and I, I do think that people who identify with Donald Trump's vision of foreign policy could find 
things to like in Washington's vision of foreign policy. That may be uh, a less snarky way of answering that question. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Yes, thanks sir. very much for being here and for your great talk. Thank you. um, I'm wondering if you have some ideas on eventual solutions. It certainly seems like the fringe is on the rise. I haven't read your book <clears throat> on the fringe. Um, and moderation is out of vogue, though maybe moderates still elect presidential uh, candidates. But on the federal level, at least, our representatives seem to be responding to voters. And mm. so um, it, then it goes back to the voters. Are there ways um, or fixes you'd think about constitutional democracy versus parliamentary democracy, methods of primaries sure. uh, in our federal elections that you think could fix this or not? I, I, I absolutely believe there, there are fixes. Uh, I think Abraham Lincoln is said to have said that I'm an optimist because I don't see the point in being anything else. Um, I do think we need to reconcile ourselves to the fact that even the youngest among us will probably be uh, devoting the rest of our lives to defending liberal democracy in some form, um, which is why we need to be, uh, I think, very clear that it's worth the fighting for, which it is. The alternatives are terrible, um, even as we, the oldest and most successful liberal democracy in the world faces some real challenges. Um, I think you're right in pointing out that with regard to our political disfigurement currently, which is a result of polarization and hyperpartisanship, that is the problem. Um, that it's been exacerbated um, by what Alan was talking about, by, by gerrymandering, what I call the rigged system of redistricting. Um, right now, you know, I think there are only 35 competitive seats in the House, and it's drawn that way, barring major wave elections. So the only way these people lose lifetime employment is that they lose to closed partisan primary with usually around 6% turnout. So the tail wags the dog. The most extreme basically have veto proof, and these folks live in fear of alienating that base. So actually finding a way to come together to solve a problem becomes a disqualifier. The incentive system is entirely out of whack, and it begins there because the House often creates the bench that becomes senators and governors later. Um, are there other factors? Absolutely. The rise of partisan media has been uh, deeply, uh, I think, unhelpful to our national debates. Even former Speaker Paul Ryan, uh, towards the end of his term, would complain about what he called the conserva conservative industrial complex. Uh, these ideological and activist groups that were not interested in solving problems. They were interested in ideological purity. If you say you're holding up the example of the founders and you want to defend the Constitution and you have contempt for principled compromise, then you don't know what you're talking about. Um, principled compromise is a good thing. It is the root of our Constitution. Um, and we, have, we can have great debates in this country, but I think the first thing is there's a larger project of um, addressing our political culture. Um, and, and that is going to take a lot of time. But the most important thing, it seems to me, is to begin with uh, addressing the rig system of redistricting, which has happened on several state levels, and there's some progress being made. The Supreme Court's going to hear a case uh, next week on this. I cannot overstate the importance of that decision to the trajectory of our republic. Yes, sir. My question is really about the same issues. I phrase it a little differently. Your comments on the cost of the, the function of government by referendum. You see it in Brexit, where a relatively small percent of the people vote. You see it here in Houston. We had a red light camera referendum. The defense lawyers paid the city council to call a referendum. I think 11 percent of the voters participated. It won by some 51 votes. Uh, we nominate by referendum. And if you can turn out a core group of 15, 10, 15 percent, 20 percent mm -hmm. of the total population. If you think abortion is murder and you don't like murder, you're likely to turn out uh, in the ref in the structure mm -hmm. of the re referendum. So, uh, you know, I, I will I will sidestep commentary on local referendum that I know nothing about. I really but not but no, I know the, the macro issue. Um, so usually th this is discussable in sort of uh, two ways. The argument in favor of referendum is that it is a form of direct democracy, and very often, for example, in cases of states overturning the rigged system redistricting, ballot initiatives were the only way to do it because 
the two parties had colluded to keep in power, and the last thing they would ever do would come up with a, 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 a you know, a, a redistricting reform because it wasn't their self-interest. They'd actually have to fight competitive general elections. I mean, already the governor of Missouri is trying to undo a public referendum in favor of redistricting reform that occurred, uh, you know, this past uh, this past election cycle, which is, is it shows remarkable contempt for a clear will of the people. Now, can they be manipulated by special interests? Sure. This is a larger problem, I think, of the the default of of um, demonizing people in our politics and fear being used as a recruiting tool in our politics. Um, and, and unfortunately, that is happening from the very top of, of our, our nation right now. Um, in something like California, the argument you usually hear against referendum is if people can vote themselves a lot of goodies but not the means to pay for them, it's a structural recipe for bankruptcy. Um, that is a real problem. That seems different to me than the Brexit problem, uh, which, again, parliamentary democracy versus our own. but. Um, whatever traditions may exist in their unwritten constitution, how you have a simple majority make a decision to something as momentous as Scotland leaving, which they won, or Brexit, which they lost, seems completely insane to me. And I do think that that utter dysfunction speaks to the danger of polarization. You have one party, UKIP, exerting influence on a governing coalition. Governing coalition not creating a supermajority, not sufficient turnout because people aren't taking it seriously. Foreign powers arguably funding that effort and spreading disinformation in ways that echo, and I think we'll find more about the connective tissue um, uh, between civic debates and social media and polarization and foreign powers. Um, but just wait, there's more. Um, but I think it speaks to, to a real danger. At the end of it all, there needs to be broader civic engagement. There needs to be more accountability. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, that comes down to competitive general elections and, and, and enlightened opinion on the part of a self-governing people. Civic education. Yes, sir. Yes, in, a, in an age where every president usually has half a dozen aides and speech writers uh, other than tweets, uh, are we, can we look back in Washington's speech and can you see any influences by any specific uh, individuals or hmm. books or writing, or were there any drafts that he might have shared with anybody else related to this speech? Yes, uh, absolutely. And I go into great length at the book, and I gave it a little bit short shrift this time around, partly because there's only so much I like to indulge my speechwriter uh, nerddom um, in, in general audiences. Um, but when I said he assembled the greatest team of ghostwriters in history, um, it's Alex, James Madison does the first draft. And then he realized that James Madison, who's been his closest aide in his first term, had been conspiring with Jefferson behind his back, and he kicks him out. A lot of bad blood. Fascinating. Um, and Hamilton then really takes over the drafting of the address. And Hamilton does a really kind of clever bit of office politics where he says, well, you know, I took the Madison draft that you've been working on, and I, I tried to clean it up a bit, but I also did this whole new draft that I think you'll like more. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Washington indeed did like it more. And, and, and it is false to say there was a lot of um, vicious sort of vindictive rumors uh, after Washington died that you know this was all just Hamilton. Not true. And one of the things I show in the book very clearly is all the ideas are squarely rooted in things Washington had said and believed and acted upon as president and before. There's a, uh, a fascinating circular address he writes when he resigns power um, at, the, at the end of the Continental uh, Army, um, a circular address to the nation. Basically, it's 13 letters of the same kind sent to 13 different state legislatures, um, where all these concepts are in place. He has a consistent political philosophy. Um, but interestingly, uh, Washington's check and balance on Hamilton is John Jay, former uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, then governor of New York. And he brings him in at the end to give a final read through kind of adult supervision. And so what he's done, among other things, is he's brought the band back together, the authors of the Federalist Papers, to work on the farewell address. So it's kind of fun. Yes? Hi. Um, I am a young person, and I yes, have to you say... Yes, <laughs> um, I have to say the polarization, the partisanship of modern politics is terrifying looking toward the future. I am not president, um, but... <laughs> What can we as individuals do to 
fight against that, to live a more Washingtonian lifestyle um, and promote that in our inner circles, hopefully making change that reverberates through the entire nation? That, that is a, a, a beautiful and perfect question. Um, it is ultimately about the examples we set in our own lives and the ripples of possibility that that example sets. I think part of the problem has been in our politics that there have not been enough people standing up and speaking out from a self-identified centrist perspective, understanding that they are speaking from the most stable ground there is in our political history, that they are part of a great tradition and not buying into this false duality of the far right versus the far left, us against them, and all the various games that get played with negative partisanship that we're watching today. Um, I mean, negative partisanship is the glue holding together our political coalitions right now to some extent. That itself is a warning because it's speaking to being opposed to something, not being in favor of something. So I think in a democracy, decisions are made by people who show up. So show up, speak out, straighten your civic backbone. Uh, try to find ways to bring people together. Identify the considerable common ground that exists on any given issue. And I think it's leading by example in these tiny platoons in our own lives that really can bring about a larger cultural change. Uh, and it's difficult right now because part of what's been done to our nation, and social media has exacerbated this, is that there's been a semi-intentional effort aided by the rise of hyperpartisan media um, to make the civic debates in our nation in decent places where sober, sane people with lives would never spend any of their time because you're busy, because you have lives, and you don't feel like spending your time arguing with screaming crazy people. The danger, of course, that is, is if we cede that ground and retreat into our own lives and our own communities, then that just turns it over to the other folks. And that's what they want. They and I, I don't say they in an us versus them way, the most committed hyper-partisans um, who've hijacked our political parties to some extent, um, they want low turnout elections. The math is easier. They want to be able to disproportionately dominate debates. Don't forget, there are a plurality of Americans are moderate, self-identified moderates. There are more moderates in this country than there are liberals or conservatives. There are more independents self-identified than Republicans or Democrats. And there are 10 states where registered independents outnumber Democrats or Republicans. So all, all these facts should give you a sense of ballast, let alone the history of it, which is part of why I wrote the book. So it, it's simply, I think, about showing up and, and trying, however imperfectly in our way, to set a counterexample. And I do think that if you uh, shine that light, um, you can have a transformative effect first at home and then on broader stages. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Two more, yes, sir. So Washington's nightmare kind of came true. Yeah, they had their well, own. They had their own. Version we've done pretty of, well. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't count us out just yet. Well, they had. They had their own version of social media. There was something like fifty or seventy-five daily newspapers yep. in New York, ultimately leading to the duel between uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton. Um, the, both the British and the French were caught outright just buying votes in subsequent elections. And mm. so what can we learn about it? We, we survived that somehow. There, there, there's, a sense, there's a sense that what we're going through now is unique, and I don't believe that's to be true. It, it, what can it, we learn from that, the lessons from that? Well, th that, is, that is very much why I, I wrote this book, why I'm, I'm working on my next book, and why I think it's so important to study history as an engaged you know, citizen of, of the republic. It, it's, these are really the table stakes, folks. We've got to know our history to engage in these debates. And it's partly, too, give us a sense of courage and comfort that we're not alone. Um, you know, the future is always uncertain. And, and I do think the American character has always been split between this native optimism and deep anxiety about American decline. So that itself gives a little bit of perspective on our emotions in, in, in the chaos of current events. That said, I do think there's sometimes a danger to diminish um, uh, attempts to disfigure our civic debates by saying, oh, see, it was terrible then, too. You know, you may think this is so terrible, but, you know, Jefferson and Adams, they really had it out, and they called each other hermaphrodites and all sorts of stuff, um, which is true except for, like, two things. First of all, they didn't have the broad means of dissemination of these views. Mm -hmm. and, and, and second of all, they lived to regret it. The Founding Fathers didn't look back upon those fights 
as the high point, but the low point of their republic. They regretted it. So we need to gain wisdom, not just self-justification from the past. Yes, foreign powers have interfered in our election. The reason, when I was writing the book, you know, the, the whole prospect of foreign powers interfering in our elections seemed like a really distant concern, you know? I mean, I, I wrote this, you know, between 2012 and, and, you know, the book was handed in well before the 2016 election. Um, but obviously it's not. And, you know, by the way, when Washington was president, Russia got uh, uh, Poland to agree to a series of partitions that left it basically a skeletal state and easy to conquer. So, I mean, th this is well within sort of national memory. It's not just, you know, the founding fathers talking about some obscure examples involving King Philip of Macedon. Um, the, the French were the concern that Washington had. They were furious that Washington wasn't throwing in with them. Jefferson said, look, this is a new empire of liberty. We should be all in. They sent an ambassador named Citizen Genet here to undermine the republic, to not only undermine the administration and lead an overthrow, but undermine the republic. And Washington took it pretty personally as well he should. I mean, his own secretary of state was working with cahoots with a foreign power. Um, and. And so I do think that those things should give us a sense of perspective to keep us calm, but they shouldn't uh, distract us from, from moral judgment or the seriousness of the challenge we face. This is different what we're doing right now. Uh, we have not had a president, we've had political figures like this, we haven't had a president like this. Um, and every presidency is different. Um, usually the office changes the man more than the man changes the office. Um, but I do think one of the things we learned from history uh, is, is that liberal democracy needs to be defended by every generation. Freedom needs to be earned anew by every generation. We can't sit it out, we can't get disgusted, we can't get dispirited, we can't retreat to rival tribes and expect the experiment to continue. If you care about the country, you gotta rise above it. And that's what the perspective of, of the past can give us in terms of the present. So one more question, yes sir. Yes sir, um, do you see the um, electoral college model continuing on or you think it's gonna find its way this is, this is an old, obscure debate, and a, a, a buddy of mine named Jesse Wegman is writing a book on that. Um, so there, there are a number of efforts in underway in different states to effectively do an end run around the Electoral College. It's not uh, without its problems, but basically saying that, you know, um, that, that they, they'll, their electors will go the way of whoever wins the popular vote. Um, it's worth keeping in mind, we, we, we've had one or two cases, literally one or two cases in the past where people have lost the popular vote and won the presidency. Um, and, and yet it's become a recurring rather dominant theme this century. That's not normal. Um, something's not working as it was intended. Um, remember the Electoral College was intended to be a check and balances. Check and balances are a good thing. Um, but, but I do think that uh, there's an, a, an active effort underway to reassess um, that and, uh, I think if the states didn't end run around it, it would be um, very interesting to see how those court cases themselves uh, were decided. Um, the Founding Fathers were not shy about constitutional amendment. Um, they also just didn't quite envision a scenario where it would become virtually impossible because of polarization to pass constitutional amendments. Um, but I, I think we need to take the reins of our democracy again. And for me, election reform is, is at the heart of it all. You know, you change the rules, you change the game. And, and it's the deeper intentions uh, that are worth looking at rather than um, pretending there was a degree of false perfection. Anyway, thank you all very much. It's been a total pleasure to be with you uh, at this beautiful, beautiful center. It's an honor. Thank you. I'll sign books later.